let's talk about Peggy Goo. So, um, Peggy, 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 Peggy Goo. I've, um, it's been interesting to see the reaction of Peggy Goo, um, oh, the reaction of the public to Peggy Goo these last couple, these last few years or so, right? Um, it really kind of shows you the fickle nature of fandom on social media and specifically in electronic music, right? Um, I think for the most part, electronic music has been immune or maybe for the most part, I think it's been immune to what's been happening in like, you know, the general public or in most forms of popular general, more popular music for the most part, right? Um, in terms of plants, right? Industry plants, in terms of people getting undue praise, in terms of um, accusations of plagiarism. And electronic music is kind of um, skidded under the surface. Those things still happen, don't get me wrong, but it hasn't been to the extent that you see in the pop world or in hip-hop world even, right? Um, but I think the uh, arrival of Peggy Goo and maybe in some cases the um, the risk the kind of you know the would you say nastia maybe nastia kind of suffers from the same thing too but i think there's been a maybe a, a Mealy lens and charlotte the Wit. there's a few of these girls that have come have come up and have kind of, have kind of got a lot of criticism from the electronic music fan base right and also some of their peers and a lot of it has to do with the fact that some of these girls especially the ones that are at the top uh get it, it seems like from the outside are getting all the love and all the praise right all the adulation is kind of getting heaped towards them and then the girls underneath that kind of bracket are kind of feeling like they're being left behind right or feel as if like they are not getting as much praise as they should do even though in their head they think they're technically uh better than the people that are getting the praise and what what this kind of brought to mind was this quote that i've always thought about since um jordan peterson mentioned it right because he kind of uh, painted it in a really macabre and in a really sinister and a really dark way but in my head it's always seemed quite like it's always seemed kind of air it's always seemed it's not sorry it's always um it's always kind of uh stood out to me to seem kind of lofty and you know airy fairy but when jordan peterson spoke about it he gave it a really sinister edge which i've never really thought about and i'm going to read it out to you guys for now um and it's a bible verse from um again me no christian i don't go to church i don't give a flying fuck but i think um this scripture kind of is just something interesting just to think about as just you know mainly as just words right so this is a scripture um it's from matthew thirteen twelve, and it says the following i'm gonna get it up on the screen and zoom here it says the following the verse the, from, the new, new, from the new international version it says whoever wh whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even even if even what they have will be taken from them. New Living Testament. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. And then one last one, English Standard Version says, For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away so if you summarize those three um quotes right these three right here i think it kind of really accurately describes the problem that people have with peggy goo and other people that are in that kind of um uh i doubt on that sort of level it feels as if the ones that are at the top get all the opportunities and the ones that are just below don't get any right it, that's what it feels like if you're that person or if you're a fan of somebody that's a tier below those kind of girls and for me it's been interesting with peggy goo because it felt as if like in the beginning she got quite a lot of goodwill it felt as if like when she came in she was this hot um korean girl that lives in berlin um or that's from berlin I, i'm not too sure um uh, she dj's really well she makes great tracks um she plays vinyl there's loads of things that she has a great sense of style people really kind of felt she was a great she's a bit, a bit of a fresh breath of fresh air in the scene right she clearly was loving it um being behind the decks right and then came and then came her relationship with jack master who's like you know the quintessential uh party dude who's always having a good time and they just you know if if anyone kind of if there was any djs out there who represented what it who kind of um if any DJs, if there's any djs out there who seemed like they were having a time of their lives and who other fans felt as if like they could live vicariously through them it'll be jack master and peggy who right two top class djs two people operating at the top end of the spear and two people that kind of generally people felt were really good then it seemed as if like you know the peggy goo machine went into overdrive right she was literally everywhere 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 
on top of that, she's always, always on social media, always kind of posting, uploading videos. She's a child of the social media age for, for, for the most part. She's native to the app. She knows how to use it to her advantage and she's consistently getting herself out there. Um, she, the, um, she's saying yes to basically every um, streaming uh, DJ set request, which again is giving her more of an audience. It seems like because nowadays, if you're not on those kind of you know boiler rooms or those other kind of uh, platforms, they kind of they kind of act as if they kind of act like um, the DJ's version of a comedy special for the most part, right? It's like an opportunity for you to kind of get yourself out there. You might not get paid for it, but it's a good way to brand yourself and market yourself. You only have to look at somebody like a Jada G, for instance, right? She did set deck mental, and I'm sure that really kind of catapulted her up to the stratosphere. I'm sure some people knew who she was, but that 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 set really kind of um, gave her a whole new remit to kind of explore new audience, probably expose her to new festivals, blah blah blah. Mostly, John Bosombo is a good example too. He's he's um um some uh, seminal uh, set at Deck Mantle was the one that really kind of catapulted him. So she seemed like she was really kind of hustling and going for it. But then when you know her work aside, you know her own social media, her her kind of willingness to go anywhere, and everywhere, and play wherever she wherever um, the check called. Then came the press side of it, right? And they were kind of well happy to kind of have her on top of their page on your banner, right? Like, because there's no denying that she does look quite photo friendly. She is quite photogenic. She wears interesting cool colors. You know, there's just something about putting an Asian girl with a German accent that wears cool colors on the front on the front of your um, web page. That's gonna you know drive. That's hopefully gonna drive some traffic. So the press were on it, right? They were willing to kind of just like, you know, slap loads of labels on her and big her up and give her all, all the single press that she needed to get given. And I think for the most part, that is probably where the issue came from. I don't think the issue came from the fans. I think fans still love her. I think if you're a Pegagoo Goo fan, you're always going to look out for her releases. You're always going to look out for her stuff. You're going to watch, want to see her play. I'm happy to see that whenever I see, whenever I see Peggy Goo play nowadays, I think in the beginning, it was, there was a lot of dudes hanging around the booth. Now, whenever I see her play now, I see loads of girls. I see loads of girls like that are big fans of her. I look up to her, and I think that's fucking awesome. I think, um, for the most part, I'm not the I'm not really fond of the whole idea of like, ah, oh, let's get um, let's make our festival lineup fifty percent women just for the sake of it, right? I think women should be given spots on a lineup based on merit, just as much as other men that aren't noticed. Because it's weird that kind of argument that we're having now in DJ land or electronic festival land, right? Where a lot of women feel as if they're not being represented well in these festivals or these club nights. It's the same old people again and again. But even on the guy's side, I think there's guys out there that would, that, that would agree with the women that, you know, some there's some local dudes who are residents in, you know, local bars and clubs who feel as if like, they're not getting their chance, their spot to play at Fabric because it's the same old people playing again and again. And they don't get an opportunity, let alone women. So it seems as if, like, you know, women are maybe given, are, are being given preferential treatment and being popped in front of the queue when there are other people who don't get any shine whatsoever who aren't playing because you know for the most part <coughs> i think guys know especially i know if you're like an underground dj or something that isn't well known the only way you have to, the only way you can play and get yourself out there is to put on your own club night but putting your own club night is effectively you hiring the space for you to play right and then hoping that you can break even which is a big big risk right all the time just to just for you to play in front of people as hopefully they can book you so anyway, that happens. Blah 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 blah. And now, um, her late her latest song came out, right? A song of hers came out, and it felt as if the the tide was shifting. I felt it online. I'm sure some of you guys felt it too. It felt as if like finally, it not finally. It felt as if like people were now starting to hate Peggy Hu, which again is interesting because she doesn't really she not doesn't strike me as a really as somebody that you can hate on that easily. She seems quite you know easygoing. Seems fairly cool. Doesn't really talk that much. There's a few interviews here and there, but she fairly keeps she she mostly keeps herself to herself, and um, it all kind of stemmed from this track that dropped right her new track um what's the track called Starry Night, and um, this is the article there on Resident Advisor, and I think as soon as it dropped on Resident Advisor, it was on every single electronic music uh, publication that you can name. It was everywhere, it, literally everywhere, right? Like they were covering everywhere. Everyone was trying to use like you know some kind of clever pun to tie in with the track title uh but resident advisor got in there first and they said uh, peggy goo starts her own label goodie records with her new moment e moment ep and again this is something that separates her from maybe some of the other um top djs now that are around that everyone's kind of uh bigging up is that she makes tracks she makes she produces her own music and it's really good it's of a high quality um 
And she says the following: I relish what I, I relish. I wanted to be my. I realized I wanted to be my own boss with my own music. Said Gu about establishing an imprint. Uh, Peggy Gu is kicking off her own label, Gudu Records, with a new EP of her own. Moment is out on April nineteenth. We'll have two new tracks from the South Korean-born Berlin-based artist uh, called Starry Night. They love that, and they're gonna put that in there. This little adjective. She's a flame. She's hot out here. Um. Anyway. Um. And Han Pan, as her RA recommended once EP for Ninja Turtle last year, Goo layers her own vocals in Korean and English over the tracks, which again I think is going to separate her from her peers going forward. You know, she if she evolves the way I'm hoping that she does as a DJ, it'll be great to see what she how she what she develops into as a live act. I think there's a lot of room for her to grow that way and for her to be a really interesting spin on what live acts is right and not just be what most people do and just have you know live instruments it could be something a bit more with vocals it could be some visuals there there could be some choreography <coughs> maybe some <coughs> performance art pieces i'm really interested to see how she kind of does it um her evolution that way blah blah, blah. last August, goes goatee's um imprint in an id in an interview the id explained that the name comes comes from the korean word for shoes and that is also a play on gudu in her words peggy Gu does um I realized I wanted to be my own boss. At first, I wanted to have just my music, but now I think people would like to know what kind of artists I support, which is cool. So she's going to have her own thing. So anyway, um, this is great, right? Awesome for her. Congratulations doing her own thing. But the coverage of it was insane. Then people on social media started getting annoyed. Like, you know, why is she getting all the tracks? La, 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 la. Then at the back of it, that kind of really sparked the kind of outrage was this event on uh, on Resident Advisor, which kind of explained why Resident Advisor was first announced um her thingy majiggy um her label imprint so she did this event with um resident advisor tied in with nike i don't know why what the point of it was no i do know the point of it it was um to tie in with the release of the nike 720 right i'm pretty sure nike 720s so it's called lift london right um and it was a, a, a resident advisor a, a connected event um, as this profile page says, it says here, we profile three prom promising DJs following their appearance at Lyft London Party in Nike. You can also listen back to the sets. Um, on Thursday, 21st of March, we threw a party at the venue at the MO uh, venue, MOT Unit London, Unit 18 in London, which is a really nice space, actually, in collaboration with Nike that featured Peggy Goo alongside three of the UK's most exciting young DJs, all women. Uh, DJs were Danielle, Fuazia, and Mogan, while listening to recordings of their Lyft sets um so again this is a great thing i think it's cool right I'm, I'm happy to see more women get more opportunities more chances in that respect i think highlighting this is a good idea i think i like to see i like seeing what disco woman or those kind of people are, are doing or this woman i like that kind of imprint of it better because you know you just you have an agency that specifically caters towards you know uh female non-binary uh gender neutral uh individuals right or queer individuals whatever it may be and then you kind of become the home of that kind of talent so if people want to hire uh, really forward-thinking edgy djs that happen to be female they go to you as opposed to we're fabric let's just have half the half the djs come from this label it doesn't really seem sincere it doesn't seem that it's done by merit uh, but again i don't know if you're a girl if you care by merit you probably just want to be in that space because you think you're good enough right you don't really care about giving you get an opportunity of merit. You're just saying, look, I've had enough. It's the same fucking people, seven people playing all the time. Lee Burrows. Uh, Jeremy, it's the same sort of seven names. Can I have opportunity as well to play? I get it. Maybe it's that regard. But again, anyway, this this tied in with the, the appearance of this um article was, or this event tied into, you know, the back of the Nike event. Um, the DJs played. For the most part, it seemed like an interesting set. Everyone had a good time, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. And then for some some reason, I don't know how this happened, um, the news got leaked um, that supposedly um, she got paid like $40,000 or something that, to do this party, right? To do this event, like, you know, the whole thing, the Nike event, the, the DJing thing. And then people really got their, you know, their kind of panties and twists about this whole issue. Like, how the fuck did this happen? Like, how did she get all this money? Um, and I guess for me personally, I don't necessarily have a problem with it. I think um, I think she's a good enough DJ to probably command that kind of level of money nowadays. Is her praise or is her hype maybe unwarranted? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I think we just live in an era now where people do get propped up or do get um, shot up into the stars probably a lot sooner than they probably should just based on the fact that you're promoting yourself on social media. Social media is generally a shortcut to fame, a shortcut to no notoriety, right? Because you have the power to share, market, promote, advertise, whatever you make to millions of people, but just from the just from your smartphone in your pocket. So I, I completely understand that. But 
I also get the thing that maybe, just maybe, there isn't any kind of sense of parity, right? I don't know how old Peggy is, but if she's she's only been DJing for, let's say, what? Maybe 10 plus years, something like that. It's not as much as other people have been DJing in the scene. And she's already earning, I don't know, three times more than what they have been earning in their careers. I completely understand why they'd feel a little bit annoyed by it, right? And here's, and I think here's a bit of the set. Let me play a little bit of the lift set here from London. Let's get a bit of it now on the, on the screen. I can understand why they'd be annoyed by it. Right? I, I, I get it. I get it completely. And again, this is a little bit of slight observation. You know the whole DJ thing of like um, when a famous DJ is playing and there's a complete, there's a real need to like want to be next to them and you know be in the shot. I've never been that guy. Um, I think the one time we did it when we went out and saw. We went, I think, was it in a vision night in, um, or uh, we went to, what's that place called? Oval Space in Bethnal Green, right? And we went to go see Dixon and Arm play, and then we, we somehow managed to get to behind the booth, right? Took a picture of them, and they were fucking cool as fuck, and we left and we went out, right? We just took a picture and we, and we ducked out. They were really cool people. Um, and again, I wouldn't do it again. Like, I think um, we just got lucky that day. I think Dixon was just drunk and or the other people were drunk or they didn't really know what was going on. And they, we, we kind of got a picture of those two legends. Um, that was cool, right? Um, but I wouldn't do that again, especially not now, especially not at this kind of event. It just comes across a little bit beg friendly. Um, again, just my opinion. I don't know. She's not my friend. I don't know her. I think if she was my friend, that'd be a bit different. And she'd say, hey, actually, no, come through. But even then, I, can't, I quite enjoy I'm I'm one of the rare people that even if I got a little guest list to go see Drake perform live at a concert somewhere, I'd want to see it from the front of the stage. Like, you know, maybe just see it where the photo. I'd want to stand maybe where the photographer's pit is so, I don't, so I'm not getting squashed by everyone. That's a little, a little privilege you might get. But I wouldn't want to stand to the side of the stage, right? That's just not, I'm not really seeing the performance. That's not really what I want to see. I want to see what the crowd sees, but up close. Um, so I never really got the whole standing to the side of the DJ and like shocking out, like as if like, you know, it's, it's like your night. I don't know. I don't really get that personally. In my, again, in my opinion only. But this is a little video from the, the actual event. Looks, it looks fairly cool. Everyone's having fun. Raven shocking out. She's obviously smashing it, doing her thing, head to toe in Nike. But yeah, people weren't happy with this, right? They weren't happy at all with the fact that she was getting paid so much money by Nike um, to promote, you know, this shoe that no one really cares about in the scene, I guess, for the most part. But I guess for me, um, uh, what is there? Is there a little? Let me see if I can find a little uh, interview. No. So yeah. So. I guess the interesting part for me in this regard um, is that I just think having this, having read the Jeff Mills interviews, which I think you should check out. It's on Resident Advisor now. Go check it out. It's Art of DJ and Resident Advisor. It's probably one of the best interviews I've read in a long time. Um, having reread that interview three or four times, I think there is a problem. There is an issue with, you know, the scene maybe propelling people up to stardom a lot sooner than they probably should have and then it may be fizzling out for them and I, I can remember from the top of my head it may be happening to Seth Truxler right he got kind of shot to space and then he kind of fizzled out but then came back again just through his own strength too he kind of decided to kind of take a break he kind of got off the drugs got off the drinking for a bit I seem to remember and now he seems like he's, a, he's in a far better place than he was previously um and I see what the scene can do to people, right? It can overhype you. It can maybe make you think you're a lot better than what you are, right? Because of just, you know, just from the pure number of festivals and club nights that you do, which is probably how most DJs kind of equate how far they're going in their career. I'm sure I'm sure there's some DJs out there that obsess about how many listings they have listed on their resident advisor page. I'm sure that happens. But I think for the most part, the good thing about this current era, even with the Peggy Green included, I, I know it can be annoying uh, for some girls out there. I think there, because there is something that no one is talking about, this idea that it does seem weird that some of the biggest DJs out there that are getting promoted or that are getting put on most of the big club nights or most of the big festivals happen to be girls and they happen to be really attractive. There is something going on in the scene where they are propelling these really attractive DJ, these really attractive DJ girls um, to, you know, heady heights of stardom. And I have a, and I have a slight feeling that there are some girls out there who aren't as photogenic as some of these other ladies who are equally as tech or equally as good technically or maybe better who aren't getting the same opportunities that they are get that they, they should be getting, which is a, again another issue because you know what it does, what, it, what it goes to show is that as bad and as closed off and as um, uh, patriarchy laden and as misogynistic as the male dominated electronic DJ scene can be, what's being shown now is that 
the same thing will just happen in the in the female space. It's not going to be democratic, right? Um, Pei Yu isn't um, where she is now purely based on her DJing ability. We we must understand that, right? It is but it is kind of based on her marketability too, right? And how she looks. Um, or the people that she knows, right? These are things that we are seeing echoed in the DJ world um, on the men's side. And it's also happening on the women's side. So we're seeing that these issues are going to be reflected either way. What needs to happen, I think, and what this woman's doing and what other people are doing um, and what um, what's the, one, what's the one thing I'd like to go to in mixed garage? Oh, I forgot the name now. But anyway, what other parties in London do is that they try and promote their friends uh, their peers who are as good as they think as the other people that play at these big club nights. And the whole idea is that I'm going to keep promoting you in the hope that the one party that I do put on this book or this agent is going to be there and they're going to then think, oh, you're sick and want to put you somewhere else. But what I'm not going to do is get the bait person that always plays at all the places, get them playing at my alternative event just for the name alone and then have anything wrong, just come for that and not listen to my friends. I want my friends to be the one, the main core interest. And if your friends all happen to be girls, then no worries, do your thing. But I just don't like the idea of like forcing this idea of like, oh, let's just have parity 50-50 because it's not going to be achievable, right? Because it's, you know, by law of maths or numbers, there, there definitely isn't as much female DJs out there as male DJs. There definitely isn't. I just know that off, off the top of my head, I can just, I, I'll just assume there isn't. And if there isn't, they're probably not going to be as good as males just in terms of pure numbers. But, I do agree that when I go to a night out, I want to see my DJ reflected. I want to see the crowd reflected in the DJs I go see, right? That's the beauty of what happens when you go to Berlin for the most part. It's very interesting programming because, you know, if you go to Greece Müller, depending on the night that you go to, some events don't even promote who's playing on the night, right? You don't even know who's fucking playing on the night. But what you do see is you see people that, you see that well, whoever you're around on the, on the dance floor with is somehow reflected on, on the DJ booth, right? They look like you, right? So it's, it's a mix of people. And I think sometimes, especially in European club line, especially in the UK for the most part, we don't necessarily get that too often. It's usually a little bit of a disconnect, right? So if I'm going to a nightclub and there's loads of girls around, there should be maybe a few girls playing on the lineup. It's just, you know, it should, should be like a, a even as a, as a fucking token, just get one or two on there for fuck's sake, right? Um, but again, I just think the beauty of nowadays, like I go back before, is that we have social media, the internet. So regardless of what you think of how much praise Pegu is getting, what you can do is just promote yourself. You can put yourself out there. You can become your own publicist, marketer, agent, manager, and you can finally get the voice, the, the vision out for yourself to the public, right? You could essentially stream your sets from your mobile phone, just playing at home. I'm thinking about doing that myself. You can um, record your sets and upload them onto SoundCloud. You can promote your events on Facebook with Facebook ads. You can post flyers on Instagram. You can really, really get yourself out there. It might, now, it might, it's not going to be. It might not be the same level as getting a check from um, Nike for forty thousand dollars from, um, from as Pay You Good did. But eventually, you'll get to the level that you want to get to. And I think, for the most part, for most DJs, I think for myself anyway, and I'm, you know, and I'm on the low, I'm on the lowest, 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 lowest of the rungs. But for most DJs out there, I think what we all want is just the ability to be able to play regularly and have that sustain our lifestyle. We want to pay our rent, um, go on holiday, buy nice things through the skill that we've learned of DJing. That's all we want to do, right? So I think, as much as it would be great if all of us could have nike billboards and adverts i think we have to be honest and just say you know not all of us are going to get that because not all of us are blessed with the looks that some of these other DJs have or the marketability or the person or the personality or the charisma or the charm or the on-camera appeal as some people we don't have some of us don't, just don't have that i know i have that it's fucking space but no, <laughs> some of us don't have that so if you don't have that then there are other avenues for you to get then make some money right there, i'm sure there's people out there who play in various bars and clubs around the country who charge a decent amount and they make bank, right? They make absolute bank, right? They make bank. They're able to sustain themselves. They work maybe part-time and they live pretty good lives. And I think for the most part, the fact that you can do that is beautiful. And I know for some some reason, you know, the festival thing is getting annoying, but I think there are more club, there are more clubs and bars opening up, you know, in some areas, not in London. Uh, there's more alternative festivals popping up, especially here in London. There's all opportunities for everyone. It's gonna it's gonna always come around. But I just don't think throwing stones at somebody like Peggy Goo, um, because she's getting all the opportunities is fair. Because I think as we've seen in the male dominated uh, DJ industry, it's the same thing, right? I'm sure the top ten male DJs get paid three to four, five times more than the ones just outside the top ten. 
It's always been that way, right? Um, and I'm thinking, and I'm se- you're seeing the same thing happen in the female space, especially when they're photo friendly, especially when they dress well, especially when they've got they've got good, they speak well. Like those opportunities are only, always going to come their way. You can't really deny that. Um, but what is healthy for the scene is that the people underneath the top ten, the people in in tier B, tier C are able to sustain a career. That's that's the strength of a good scene. It's not that we have A-class DJs getting getting paid millions of bucks to go play for people in Ibiza. The, what makes a good scene is the fact that B and C, even D, can, um, you know, have a healthy lifestyle, can sustain themselves, can pay for things just through DJing alone. That's where the strength of our scene comes from. So I think, I, I get it. The Peggy Goo thing is annoying. I get it. The media overdrive, her promoter is annoying, but I don't think it's her fault, you know, the the... the the publications out there love to talk about her, I guess, because she generates clicks, generates engagement. I don't think it's her fault. I don't think it's fair to throw stones at her. And again, I'm interested to see how she evolves over time. There might have been, there is a feeling in me that's like maybe she got pushed forward a bit too early, but I think she's been, she's done great so far. She just got thrown in the deep end and just kind of carried on swimming. I'm interested to see how she evolves and develops over the years. And I'm sure she's going to be a mainstay in the industry. But I just think in general, I think it's our responsibility as a scene of rule, right? To kind of, you know, support her during this kind of journey. I don't think it's fair to kind of throw stones at her, especially the other female DJs throwing stones. I just think that I don't think that's constructive at all because she plays a role as does the other DJs. They all, we all play a role in kind of just maintaining where the scene goes and the kind of dictating where it kind of evolves to the future. That's kind of my rant on the one, Peggy.